Hello and welcome to Distillations, the science, culture and history podcast. I'm Michal Maya, a historian of science and editor of Distillations magazine here at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. And I'm Bob Kenworthy, CHF's in-house chemist. There are so many problems with our planet. There's climate change, overpopulation, and of course the fact that we're depleting our resources. But what if there was a solution? What if we could start over somewhere else, somewhere in this vast universe? Is space the place? Trying to save humanity by mining asteroids. First, we'll go to Silicon Valley, where an asteroid mining company has lofty goals to solve humanity's problems, and maybe make a lot of money at the same time. I'd love to see the, uh, the Olympics on the moon and let your, let your imagination run wild and, and read some science fiction. And then we'll talk to Patrick McRae, a historian of science and technology who has spent a lot of time thinking about the utopian space visions of the last century and what motivates off-planet thinking. Well, I think we would all like to imagine that we live in a world where the supply of everything from uh, oil and uh, lithium to Oreo cookies is, is unlimited, but the reality is that we don't. All coming up on Distillations. Okay, we're running out of stuff on Earth, important stuff like water, fuel, and land. But don't worry, a company in Silicon Valley thinks it has a solution. I'm Katie Gilbert. And I'm Annie Kostakis. So what company is this? They're called Deep Space Industries. Let me just play you a clip from their promo video. What will tomorrow look like? Our world is at its limits. And yet, we all want more. And why not? Why shouldn't the future be brighter than today? But where will it come from? Simple. The same rocks that could fall from our skies also contain everything we could ever need. It's time someone seized the opportunity. Whoa, is this real? It sounds like a movie. I know, it really does, doesn't it? But actually, Deep Space Industries, or DSI, is an asteroid mining company. They want to extract water and metal from asteroids to use in space, and eventually maybe here on Earth. Here's DSI CEO Daniel Faber. The thing that's most excited me, I think, so far is the realization that this is possible. The realization that this is definitely going to happen. It's going to happen in my lifetime. That's the most exciting thing. Okay, confession. I'm not sure I know what an asteroid really is. Yeah, no, don't worry. I needed a refresher too. So here's what I've learned. Asteroids are the building blocks of the planets. They're left over from the creation of the solar system. You may know them best as those giant chunks of rock floating through space in The Empire Strikes Back. You're not actually going into an asteroid field. They'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? (laughs) Okay, so asteroids seem kind of scary. What's so great about them? Well, just like our own planet, asteroids contain metals like iron and platinum. Some of them also contain water. DSI may send these things back to Earth at some point, but their shorter-term plan is to sell this stuff to other companies that are already in outer space. Wait a minute, how many companies are there in outer space? So right now, there's not so many. Just the International Space Station and some satellites. And DSI wants them to be their first customers. But within 10 years, DSI envisioned space tourists, space transportation companies, and eventually space colonies. Space colonies? Like humans living in space? Is this really going to happen? Daniel Faber thinks so, and he wants to be there when it does. They have big plans. Basically, DSI wants to be a space gas station, a space manufacturing plant, and a giant Home Depot in space all rolled into one. They're setting up shop so they'll be ready for the developers whenever they decide to come. And at that point, you are looking at uh, at hotels, at at sports stadiums. Uh, I'd love to see the uh, the Olympics on the moon and let your let your imagination run wild and and read some science fiction. Okay, so is this even possible or desirable? I mean, the Olympics on the moon, wouldn't that be kind of barren and dusty? And isn't all of this a little bit premature? He doesn't think so. There'll always be people who think that things that haven't been done can't be done. And you know, we should often listen to them. They, they have interesting points of view and we can, we can learn a lot. And then we intend to go and do it anyway. We don't need everybody to, uh, to believe right now that, uh, that this is real or important. We just need enough people to, uh, to see what the future could be like and to want to help us build that future. And there are people, 
with a lot of money who share this dreamy vision of the future. There's another asteroid mining company called Planetary Resources, and their list of investors includes Google CEO Larry Page, billionaire Sir Richard Branson, and director James Cameron. Even Neil deGrasse Tyson, even though he's not an investor, is very enthusiastic about the possibilities of resources in space. Okay, so how does asteroid mining actually work? It seems like it would be pretty complicated, especially because of the whole zero gravity thing. Right, I know, and... Yeah, here's how Daniel Faber puts it. So to describe how the mining is done presupposes slightly better knowledge of the geology than we have right now. Ah, I see. So nobody really knows how this is going to work. Well, not quite. They're doing research with meteorite samples, and they're also thinking about the way mining happens on Earth and just tweaking it, you know, for space. Here's some general asteroid mining ideas floating around. First... You have to find an asteroid to mine. Scientists have already found half a million. But they all have different chemical makeups. Some are stony, some are metallic, and some are more clay-like, so you have to choose wisely. And it's going to be quite a journey. Each asteroid is about 1 million to 3 million kilometers from the next one. Then, there's the actual mining. On Earth, 4.5 billion years of geological activity has concentrated metals together, but the metals on asteroids are spread throughout the rock. And then there's the water. It's not liquid. It's chemically fused into the rocks. One crazy idea Planetary Resources has is to put a huge bag around an asteroid, heat it up to vaporize the water, and trap it in the bag. Boom. Water. What do they want to do with all the water? I mean, there's no way that we could send it all back to Earth, right? even though we could really use it here. Right, that wouldn't make sense. They'd use it as rocket fuel instead. Splitting it into hydrogen and oxygen would allow them to do that. So, to sum up, basically, DSI needs to figure all of this stuff out, and then they need to figure out how to do it all in zero gravity with robots. <laughs> this is crazy. I know, potentially awesome, but also a little crazy. So what's motivating all of these people? Yeah, I mean, I only talked to Daniel Faber, but he says his goal, in essence, is to save humanity. So I got into this area, th this field, and having, uh, having thought a lot about the world, decided that the biggest benefit uh, of anything that I could work on, the biggest benefit to humanity, was going to be moving people off planet. It could also potentially make him and his investors very, very rich assuming a space market does take off. But Daniel Faber's treating this as a long game. He says it'll be at least 10 to 12 years before the company is selling anything from its mines. Okay, so they're banking on the idea that humans will definitely live off planet sometime soon, whether they want to or they need to. Right. Daniel Faber thinks of space colonization as this century's quest for the new world. Just as uh, expansion of humanity into the Western Hemisphere uh, opened up so many things uh, for the world and, and I think changed Europe in the long term in, in a very, very positive way. Similarly, expansion into the solar system will benefit humanity here on Earth as well and provide interesting opportunities for settlers, for explorers, for pioneers who, who choose to go out there and, uh, and take the risks and, and make a life and a home uh, off the Earth. But it's not going to be like the opening of the Wild West, you know, where you could just take a horse team and set up a farm. You can't do that uh, out there. There's no place like Earth uh, except here on Earth. That was Mark Hammergren. He's an astronomer at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Okay, so Mark thinks it won't be so easy. But I'm wondering, even if we can do this, will people really want to do it? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because Mark also brought up the Antarctica point. Antarctica? I thought we were talking about space. Okay, so stay with me. There's a lot of talk about wanting to colonize Mars, right? But Antarctica is way more hospitable than Mars. I mean, you don't need a spacesuit to go there. They have gravity there, and even though explorers have been going to Antarctica for over a century, nobody really wants to live there. I mean, it's still just small scientific outposts. Huh, that's true. You know what all this is starting to remind me of? It's like the morning after you throw a party and your apartment is a disaster and you think, oh my god, this place is a dump. I have to move. It's like we're treating the planet like our own messy apartment. 
Yeah, it's a good point. And yeah, I've definitely been there. And the thing is, I think Mark would agree with you. Right now, everybody's looking at asteroid mining as being some kind of limitless frontier. And uh, we've run through periods of that same kind of thinking here on Earth before, and uh, uh, that's led to all kinds of other, other consequences. And he thinks it's not so cost-effective either. There really isn't a huge need for this material in space right now. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, right? It's not going to be economical until you have a market. You're not going to have the market until it gets economically viable to, to have a market up there. And as far as mining asteroids for things to use on Earth? There are far richer supplies of these elements in dumps here on Earth than in asteroids. So it makes more sense to mine old technological dumps than it is to go out to space. Okay, now I'm thinking of that Star Wars clip, and I'm wondering if there's anything we should be concerned about. Couldn't this actually be dangerous? Overall, Mark's not too worried about the safety of a future space mining enterprise, except for one kind of terrifying point. Uh, you have to be able to drag this material back to near-Earth space, so er Earth orbit. So that means that you will have, by definition, the capability of altering the trajectory of an asteroid or bringing a huge mass close to Earth. So if someone was so inclined, they might decide to uh, target that to the surface of the Earth instead. So not that they would necessarily want to do that, but uh, humans have this terrible history of employing technologies for war, uh, regardless of uh, the original thoughts behind them. Whoa. But, I mean, none of this is even legal yet, right? Actually, it is legal. This past November, President Obama signed a bill into law that gives U.S. companies legal ownership over any materials they extract from asteroids, which basically means the DSI is one step closer to their dream. We can have it all. We can have an amazing future. The frontier is coming, and our time is now. For Distillations, I'm Katie Gilbert. And I'm Annie Kostakis. I'm almost convinced that we'll be living in space in no time. Except that... Uh... Except this isn't the first time utopian visions of space colonies have filled the brains of dreamers and scientists. Ah, right. Far from it. In the 1970s, a Princeton physicist named Gerard O'Neill began dreaming about space as a place where anyone could live. And then he spent years mapping out the ways humans could get to and live off the planet. O'Neill started a whole movement that he called the humanization of space. O'Neill's idea was very similar to the not-yet-existing space colonies that today's asteroid mining companies are basing their own business plans on. Um, I think there's a lot of similarity, except for one important difference. This is Patrick McRae. He's a historian of science and technology. And that important difference is this. You know, people like Gerard O'Neill, or especially Gerard O'Neill, who was promoting these ideas for space settlements and space colonization, he was promoting this with an eye toward the idea that this would benefit all of humanity, that this wasn't simply um, about making money, and it wasn't only about benefiting a very narrow segment of the population. If you jump ahead 40 years, these various companies that are talking about asteroid mining have a, mm, how can we put it, a, a libertarian-tinged uh, framework that they're working within. And it, from what I've read, I don't really get the sense that they're doing this from altruistic purposes of benefiting humanity at large, but I sense that they're doing it more from a uh, personal benefit um, point of view. Patrick is a history professor at UC Santa Barbara, and he wrote a book called The Visioneers, how a group of elite scientists pursued space colonies, nanotechnologies, and a limitless future. He seems like a good person to put this whole asteroid mining thing into perspective. In 1972, a book called The Limits to Growth stated that the Earth's resources were finite and humans were on track to use them up and to use them up quickly. What reactions did people have? 
The Limits report stimulated this really fierce debate about this need for a steady state economy, but some people refused to accept this concept of limits, technological or otherwise. We would all like to imagine that we live in a world where um, <laughs> the supply of everything from uh, oil and uh, lithium to Oreo cookies is, is unlimited, but the reality is that we don't. What? We can't have all the Oreo cookies we want? <laughs> but I guess Gerald O'Neill was one of those people who didn't want to be constrained by any limits. He was inspired by them, and he saw space as the answer just like Daniel Faber and Deep Space Industries. So why is space continually seen as the, the solution to humanity's problems? What is the appeal of the great beyond? Well, it's a tabula rasa that you can write all sorts of alternative futures onto. I mean, it's a big, mostly empty space, and that's a lot of space to accommodate a lot of visions for the future. Both Gerard O'Neill and Daniel Faber talk about space like it's the new Wild West, like it's some kind of new final frontier. I, I can hear the Star Trek theme just saying these words. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Of course, you know, anybody who studies the history of the Western United States um, you know, will point to the fact that this idea of the frontier is a very uh, damaging idea. You know, the frontier experience was a very unequal one, and not everybody uh, benefited from it, you know, by any means. One of the things that struck me is a interview that O'Neill gave to the New York Times, I think in the late 1970s, and he was talking about how space colonies, space settlements could be a chance to sort of uh, have a do-over, if you will, of the American frontier experience but to do it, as he said, quote, without killing any Indians, end quote. Patrick, you use the term visioneer to describe someone who's both a visionary and an engineer. So who are these people? These are hybrid actors. So they have this really strong vision of what I guess we can call the medium term future, a future that they imagined they would live long enough to be able to see. And this was coupled with this engineering and design talents that they had that was based on established science. Gerard O'Neill inspired a lot of people way back in the 1970s. He found fans in people like Timothy Leary, who was a Harvard professor, a convicted felon, and the LSD guru. There was also a whole community of, I want to call them back to the landers, sort of hippie types, living off the grid and who really wanted to live in space. One of my favorite things that I found in the course of my research was a L5 bumper sticker which showed Spaceship Earth, and the slogan on the bumper sticker says, if you love it, leave it. The basic point being that if you truly were an environmentalist, you would work to get off the planet, so the um, human footprint would be less uh, pronounced. Just to clarify, you're talking about the L5 Society, a group passionate about O'Neill's ideas. What Wasn't it ironic that People might otherwise reject science and technology, and, and yet they wanted to be part of something that was so dependent on it? The thing that I find really interesting about this is we oftentimes think of the American counterculture in the late 60s, early 70s as being anti-science or anti-technology. It was just simply opposed to certain forms of science and technology, you know, big science, government science, military science, things like that. But when it came to science and technology, the counterculture was more than happy to embrace um, communication with dolphins and artisanal cheese making and space colonies as sort of an alternative, groovier, paisley colored science, if you will. <laughs> so sadly, none of these flower children ever got to go to space, and neither did O'Neill. His space plans made him famous, but ultimately there just wasn't the government's support for them. He eventually got sick with cancer and died in the early 90s. Patrick, do you think things might have turned out differently if O'Neill had lived longer? Um, I've often wondered, you know, what would have happened if he had lived another 10 years or so, or if he had been in better health through the 1980s to see some of his ideas uh, to fruition. Also, by the time we get to the 1980s, I think technological frontiers uh, if we're going to use that term, had shifted to uh, in other directions. People began to think about biotechnology and cyberspace and eventually nanotechnologies as sort of the next frontier. And when we think about uh, space exploration today, sort of the 1970s style of it, 
it seems decidedly old fashioned. I mean, I know whenever I teach my undergraduates at the University of California, um, they're certainly interested in the nuclear age and the information age, but somehow space exploration to them really does seem to be a thing in the past. And yet a company like Deep Space Industries seems very confident that space colonies are imminent and that asteroid mining is just around the corner. And didn't the U.S. Senate just pass a bill that says any material you extract from space uh, you're, you're able to keep? This idea that somehow um, United States citizens can reap the benefits of anything they can find in space, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, let me know when that happens. I think it's important to have um, a small population of these visioneers who propose these radical ideas for the future and in a sense kind of throw down a challenge for other people to either prove or disprove. You know, if we think about technological ecosystems, I mean, think about the various species that inhabit that ecosystem. So you've got your engineers and your venture capitalists and your patent lawyers and your CEOs and the people who actually make the stuff. and people who buy it. And I think you would like to have a small number of visioneers in that system. I guess we could think of them as charismatic megafauna, if you will. But I don't think you want to have a system that has uh, an overpopulation of them. I mean, at some point, um, the uh, ideas need to stop and the cutting of metal and the drilling of holes and all that needs to begin. I think that these conversations that visioneers like Gerard O'Neill sparked oftentimes serve as conversations about our technological present. So they're not so much um, just about the future, but they stimulate dialogue and conversations about the sort of future that we want to have. I think also these extravagant visions for the future, while they certainly stimulate dialogue and spark discussion, can also uh, be a distraction from the real problems at hand. And it also gives people unrealistic hope and prevents them from making any real changes. I mean, why should I stop driving so much if some scientist 50 years from now is going to fix the problem by putting giant mirrors in space? For Distillations, I'm Michal Meyer. And I'm Bob Kenworthy. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening.